is waiting on fries that you don't get it? You don't, what do you mean you don't get waiting on fries? Hopefully the customer never hears waiting on fries, but all this time on the entree and it's perfectly executed and then you're it's like, ready to go. I forgot to fire the fries. I just always use that when I forgot to put somebody's order in and I was like, hey, I'm just waiting on the fries. It's going to be two more minutes. Realistically, I come back 10 minutes with the food. Exactly. <laughs> they just know that their food's not there in the service that they're still waiting on fries. I guess we're just waiting on fries. <laughs> I got a story to tell. Oh, yeah, what do you got? Oh, man. These things are out of control. I had the craziest last weekend ordering online. I can't pay cash. I can't pay cash on my order online. I have to use a credit card. Yeah. That, yeah, that's how that works. <laughs> so here's the thing. Let there me should set be this a pickup with cash option. Oh. Should be, that would make it a lot simpler. Also, no, that is a terrible idea because what about people that are like, oh, I got high and I forgot to go pick it up, and then you're sitting there and you're left with the bag. Plus, you want to just go in and get it and leave. Yeah, True. and announce these. So check this out, right? I'm going to the bro's place. We're hungry. I said, let me pick up some pies. We're on way. I assigned some tasks to Babe. Babe's job is to get the task fulfilled. She goes on Google. She types in Nona's Pizza. In White Plains, which is the, you know, the one that I like. It's close proximity. It's got good pies. I'm not getting paid for this. Uh, but she puts it in, and now Google comes up, and it says all those standard things you see on Google. What's on the little circle list that you usually see? It's like call. Contact us now, directions, order now maybe, sometimes yeah. if you're lucky. So that's Website. it. The order. In- you stop yawning? <laughs> I'm telling a story, bro. I'm sorry. Clearly it's, it's not an uh, interesting story. Unreal. So she clicks the order now button, right? Okay. And now... She's filling out a form, and I'm like, I wanted to do the, why don't you just call them and put the order in? It's an old pizza place that's been there forever. It'll be a lot faster if you just do it this way. So that's what she does. She puts it in, and then I have to go out of the car to go get it because chivalry's not dead, and I'm a gentleman. So I go pick it up from the door of Nona's, and I go, hey, I'm picking up an order for so-and-so. Uh, we don't have that. Are you sure? The grandma, it's grandma pie. It's a Sicilian uh, zucchini sticks, maybe on that. And I'm like, no, no zucchini sticks. I don't have my phone on me. I gotta run back out to the car and find out if there's zucchini sticks by some slim odds. Turns out she got zucchini sticks, right? So I run back in and I go, yeah, it's the order with the zucchini sticks. But he goes, it's not under that name. And I say, I don't know why it's not under the name. We ordered it on online through your Google page where it says order now. And now we just talked about this like a couple months back, guys, where we were like, yo, places are getting hijacked from third party uh, ordering services and they're putting in the orders and they're collecting processing fees and inflating a little bit of the price on the orders. So sure enough, I walk in here and he goes, it's also not paid for. And I go, no, 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 it's completely paid for online. Like it's on the bank account, 55 bucks out of the pocket, you know? So he goes, nah, I can assure you. So now we have to go back. I have to pay second fifty dollars to get the pies. It's absurd. Have you? Sounds like you, you got caught. Sounds like you got scammed by. Just you fed up with my story already. I'm fed up with the whole existence of third party apps and the, you know, siphoning of the lifeblood of the restaurant onto some stupid. This is why I hate DoorDash. So like I, I this is like the DoorDash business Do- model. DoorDash came into the market. Right? And they were like, you know, they didn't get us to sign up because they were the small guy, right? There was Grubhub and there was Uber Eats and they had already had the market share. Nobody knew about DoorDash. So when they called and they said, we'd like to be a partner, naturally the restaurant said, I don't know, another one of these stupid things, you know, like, get out of here. Who are you? And they're like, oh, we're the fastest growing, you know, whatever. And I was like, you're the fastest growing because the other one's already grown, you know? (laughs) Like, my four-year-old is the fastest-growing person in my house, right? But he's Stats. not the biggest, <laughs> you know? So, you know, that's how they came in with that. And, you know, we declined it. And then, sure enough, you get somebody call up on the phone and say, you know, we're placing an order for pickup for so-and-so. And then they give you the order and they give you a credit. This At least they gave me a credit card over the phone for this one. And then, sure enough, a little bit later, this guy walks in with a DoorDash shirt and a DoorDash bag picks up the order. I, I catch on to it, and what they're doing is they're putting our menu on their website, taking the order on their website, 
and having someone call in and order it from here and then facilitating their driver to sell it to their person. But they don't get our actual menu, so they have all kinds of mistakes and wrong yeah. charges and stuff like that. And because not they don't get the menu, the right menu they just pull it off. Yeah, they just pull it off of whatever, right. you know, like they don't have an actual physical menu of like what we want to sell online. So they just like sell some stuff they see on Instagram and present that as our menu to the guests. And then sure enough, the guest calls back and complains. And um, that's how we figured it out. You're like, why aren't there meatball sliders in my order like I ordered? And you're like, lady, we stopped selling meatball sliders Years in ago. 2019. Yeah, yeah, but and of course, when the DoorDash calls in the order, we say we don't carry that. They're like, okay, never mind. Just take the rest of the stuff. Yep. But they never go back to the customer and say we don't carry that. And there's all this confusion. So I kicked out with DoorDash, actually filed a cease and desist <laughs> against them <laughs> and said, like, stop calling. And they, they stopped. And then later on, they tried to resell me on the whole DoorDash thing and I'm like you might have a better deal now but because of the way you entered the market I'm I'm I will never sign up with you cuz you yeah. you know who knows what kind of damage you did to how many you know companies restaurants etc I actually offered the manager that was calling me he was a really good salesman he gave a great sales pitch I offered him a job as a manager here. <laughs> so I was like, I'm not going to sign up with DoorDash, but if you want to work for a good company, you, I, I'm hiring. That's nice. <laughs> uh, now, that's the thing, too, is like, yeah, this is a third-party app that essentially hijacked the Google page because right alongside all those buttons that you're comfortable seeing and familiar with, another similar one popped up that said, order now. Yep. So you're thinking it's safe. You're thinking it's Google. And then it redirects you to, and the name of that company was Bring Me That. And I have no problem saying the name of this company. They're not going to be around that much longer. There's too much competition and the way they're doing business isn't going to last long enough. So sure enough, exactly what happened. These companies that are just adding people's menus on that look like they're maybe susceptible to a hijacking. They're probably doing it in such great numbers that they're not following back up any of these menus to see if there's any changes at all. And that's the big problem because things change over time. So now plus they just don't have the right to represent the company. Oh, yeah. You, you want to check out some Better Business Bureau reports on that company? Which Go have mean fun. Shit, so sure enough, I kept the receipt, and I didn't really know what was going on. I'm trying to figure it out myself here. Why did I just pay for 120 bucks for two pies? I don't get it. I mean, they're basically leeches. No, I'm with piggyback I'm, off of the hard work of people that spent a decade plus in the industry trying to build up a brand name, and they just hop up on it and represent themselves as a partner with that restaurant and you know, sully the name of yeah. the place that worked so hard to get there. And they don't give a shit because they got their $4 processing fee. Completely. So, you know, sure enough, uh, now Babe walks into the place too. Oh, man, you don't want Babe to walk into the place. I was handling it. Everything was calm and collective. Now Babe's here. Now this dude better watch out because I'm calm and collective, and she's got to be the bad cop here now, right? So sure enough, he's the guy behind the counter is like, I have no idea what this is. We don't work with this company. And I'm like, yeah, but it's on your page. Like, this is your responsibility owning a restaurant to protect your assets. Yeah, and but you some of the older alarmed. guys don't know. That's the problem. Yes. Correct. You and know? I get that. And that's where they feast off. Like, guys like, like us, I caught on to it pretty quickly. And I was right. able to eliminate and eradicate the, you know, the connections or whatever. And I'm on top of our Google page and make sure that the right link says that. But some of these old school guys, especially old school pizzerias like that, they don't even know. Like they, you know, they just like, run their business. They have a phone number and that's it. They don't even know they get online orders. You know, I feel like like I guarantee that that order came in on the phone. Like you probably ordered online. They called on the phone and ordered Nona's. They tried to pay, but they were like, no, cash only. And I don't know if Nona's would turn away a, a card over the the phone, but sure enough, yeah, I kept the receipt. I looked. Some at, places won't take a card over the phone because uh, you need to have the chip. Yeah, uh, correct and. I looked at the name on the thing. I looked at the phone number on the thing. It was my order for sure. It wasn't my number. It wasn't my name. So, so of that's course, what they did. I did what any chick would do while she's trying to figure out what her boyfriend's doing when he's around. I looked up that phone number. <laughs> and I found that this phone number was from Ohio. And that, sure enough, is the exact same place that that company is located, Ohio. So sure enough, yeah, we had to call the, the card company and label it as fraud. We just had to pay twice. They only refunded the processing payment fee, and they still charged the 50 bucks. So now she had to escalate this whole thing on the card even further. Absurd. You know, these are the Wait, things. they refunded their fee, but not they the restaurant fee? They refunded their fee, but not the fee of, quote-unquote, pizza payment. That didn't go to the pizzeria. That didn't even get to the pizzeria, as they claimed. Insane. But this is, like, this is where we're at now, you know? 
This is why when you're ordering from your spot, you know, whatever it is, your favorite pizzeria, you your know who you're local from. barbecue restaurant, find their website, call the phone, but make sure you're ordering through there. Find their website, find their promo code. Yeah. Make sure you're Go to their website right. and order through their website with it. They control and you know you're ordering through the uh, the correct channels. Talking about ordering from websites, New York Prime Beef, our guy Austin Abraham, uh, episode six, we talked to him about all this meat stuff. I knew nothing before we had that episode, and he this guy is a pro stuff. with with this with the transition there. Yeah, he like right Seamless. into that, bam into Yo, that. Yeah, but check this out because apparently you guys spend a lot of money on meat. I didn't even know it because when you were like, yeah, it's free shipping on orders over two hundred dollars, two hundred instead of paying you know a shipping fee. I had no idea that people even order meat over $200, and then sure enough, talking to everybody in the room, that's like a normal thing when you're ordering quality beef. Just order more beef. You were talking about, what were you talking order about? Wagyu. Some beef. domestic Wagyu, you can Boom. get some Australian Wagyu, Boom. you can get that Japanese A5 Miyazaki but Wagyu. But if you don't want to get crazy like that, you, you can just to. go in and get one of their packs, and they have like samplers of everything. You can yeah. get a little bit of Wagyu, a little bit of dry age, so a little bit of you know burger patties, some sausage links. They got some really cool stuff up there. I think they're even offering some free crab cakes right now. Sure enough, that, that save 15% using our code here, FRIES15. That's 15% off, FRIES15. NewYorkPrimeBeef.com. Now, let's talk about some other stuff real quick. You ready for this, guys? No. I was so sick of being broke. I was so sick of sitting on the couch. We launched a cocktail garnish company. That's what we did. We wow. sliced up some garnish. We got it dehydrated. We're talking to co-packers. We're bringing this thing to market. It's showing up on Amazon. How do you dehydrate a fruit? You know what you do? You slice it nice and thin. You let it, it sit into, in the dehydrator. Uh, yeah. So relatively low out? temperature. No, relatively low temperature for an extended amount of time. And what it's happens if the temperature is too high, Nooms? Well, obviously, it's going to burn. Because some places have the dehydrator ores, right? Isn't there they? I've seen some bars have like thing on the bar that dehydrates it. It's like a mini oven or whatever. Like yeah, 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 a little circle guy. Right? But you can use a regular oven? Yeah. So, I mean, you're looking for a temperature between, like, 130 to 140. Which a lot of ovens do not go down low enough to. Well, some of the newer ones. Some of the electric ones, the newer ones. <laughs> <laughs> nice you can set them, too. Nice shot. Yeah. But um, you're looking for a relatively low temperature, relatively long amount of time. Just pull out the moisture without burning the actual. So, item. sure enough, too, this is what happened. We bagged them up. We got them up on Amazon. There's a lot of people out there that are just making drinks at home because they're not really going out because of COVID. And we said, hey, there's a hole in the market here. Let's fix it. So sure enough, we started bagging them. We started tagging them. We're getting them out there. And soon enough, we'll expand into bigger things. But you can go check that out because guess what we're doing, Just? We're putting in... You don't know what we're doing? We're going to go to the Instagram account. For those listening, I was looking back and forth excitedly. <laughs> we're going to go on to the Instagram account, and we're going to open up the Waiting on Fries shop, which you could actually get Just's rib rub on, right? Bam. Yeah. yeah. Oh, rub. And then also we'll link up some of the cocktail garnishes in case you got some things going out for gifts or whatnot, and we'll hit you with one of those codes too. Actually, that code is pinky out. You could use that if you want. It's going to take pinky, 20% out. Pinky out. Yeah, because right. that's how you should be drinking those drinks with your pinky, pinky out, out, you know? Okay. Guys, Dan Carlos just joined us in the building. This guy is responsible for Orin Oak, Birdhouse. He's got a truck with ice cream in it. Shout out to Nikki Bono we just had on the episode a couple uh, episodes ago, right? Go check that one out if you're interested in ice cream. But you're going to teach us a little bit more about ice cream, too. We have and chicken sandwiches. And chicken sandwiches. Sure. In the yeah. last episode, Christian Petroni said, what do you say? The best uh, chicken sandwich out there. Even though he doesn't eat that much chicken. He, yeah, he, yeah he, he, he doesn't eat a lot of birds. Because of the chickens. <laughs> so com coming in now, we've had all these conversations about coronavirus, and we're like, we're sick of beating the horse, kind of. But you're yeah. kind of taking advantage of the situation. And, uh, you know, let's hit on this first before we jump into some of the history, where you just opened up in a takeout spot that's just purely for takeout. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We don't even have seats inside. And um, uh, so, yeah, me and my business partner, Pete, uh, Pete Massey, that's sort of the whole idea just stemmed from, you know, when we got shut down the first time, we were like, whoa, why don't we just kind of take this show on the road to begin with and, uh, you know, look for a little spot. And it was something that we'd always uh, sort of been thinking of doing because uh, a long term goal for us is to have uh, uh, drive through restaurants, a few of them, handful of them. So it kind of just like like, you know, the situation lent itself to that. And, um, you know, we sort of just uh, found the right location in our town. It was close enough, but far enough, and just fell, in, you know, fell into play. 
so that's kind of where we're at now. What was that space before it was your restaurant? Uh, most recently, it was a place called uh, Hudson's Deli. Was was the the birdhouse? It was it was the takeout spot? It was called Hudson's Deli. Prior to that, uh, incidentally, it was called Orinoke Pie Company, and uh, so that was kind of like an omen. You know, we saw that we actually found an old Orinoke Pie Company uh, sign in there. We were like, "Oh, dude, this kind of makes sense." So, um, yeah, you know, it's uh, looking at the photos of this birdhouse for takeout here. It literally the birdhouse for takeout, just the birdhouse. Yeah, just Orinoke Birdhouse. Yeah. So I was looking at the pictures of it, and as a guy that used to do a lot of, in streetwear and dealing with a lot of boutiques, this place is designed to look like it's almost like a sneaker store. There's mm. merchandise all over the shelves. They're hung up perfectly. Like, I'd be scared that, like, grease is coming out of the kitchen to get <laughs> these things, <laughs> yeah, yeah. kind of. There's some arcade machines in the front. It's not too wide. How, how wide is that, you oh, say? I'd say, you know, 12 to 15 feet wide. And then it goes straight back, so it's a little bit like a shoebox. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it easily could have been in in the right neighborhood. It would be a sick little retail uh, clothing shop, um, you know, a little streetwear shop or a shoe store or even a barber shop, honestly. But um, you know, it's just yeah, it was an empty little box, and and that's also there was no bathroom for customers, nothing. So we were just like, all right, it's 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 meant to be this, you know what I mean? Um, And incidentally. the the clothes that we have in there are from a couple um like local causes one of them is our buddy's charity the other one is uh, a girlfriend of ours who owns a, a small clothing company in milford um so yeah we're always looking for for people to put stuff on the shelves too if anybody's interested in doing that for sure especially local artists uh you know local artists local clothing makers you know, whatever it may be it's cool talking i mean we talk about outside the box mentalities all the time and doing things that are different than what you're traditionally used to seeing walking into a restaurant where here again, hit in the face with just all the food add ons that you can get. And now coming in to link with guys that are just local in the community and show that love back to them. I'm sure that brings in a handful of people in itself. Whereas, Hey, go check out my clothes. They're featured over here. Absolutely. And to go a little bit deeper into that too, is, are you essentially buying these off of them in the wholesale model or are you no honestly man that we we're, we're consigning really they're okay. they're selling their products in there we get a real small fee yeah. honestly it just gives us stuff to have on the walls man and it just it, it makes it look you know full it makes the place look full and, and and you know if they sell something or it does draw some some cross uh you know cross promotion that that's great that's awesome that's what it's all about um and uh you know i wear the stuff too and we got our own sweatshirts hanging up in there as well and you know things like that um, and uh, all the art on the walls was done by a, a local graffiti artist, a buddy of mine, John Tarka. He does a lot of local stuff all over Milford, Trumbull, Stratford. Uh, and he, he's from Philly. So, I mean, he, he's worked his way down over the years. And, uh, I mean, countless, countless pieces of art all over. So, uh, he lent a hand and really hooked up the whole back wall. I mean, it, it looks awesome in there for what it is. Um, you know, and yeah. the chicken sandwiches are good, too. <laughs> no, they're there, and that's for sure. Yeah. And you put... It's funny, I looked at the menu, and the menu is, you have two sections on it, and it's chicken sandwiches under one section, uh, yeah. and the next sam- section is not chicken not sandwiches. Not chicken yeah. sandwiches. <laughs> yeah. So these recipes are things that you've pretty much worked on for some time, and developed being the guy with the chicken sandwiches. Yeah. I mean, they sort of just kind of, um, you know, they, they sort of just evolve on themselves. You know, you start out with the, with the chicken sandwich that we made. The original one is, you know, cheese and bacon and ranch. And uh, and honestly, people are like, oh, the ranch, the ranch, the ranch. You want to know the ranch recipe? Google ranch dressing. <laughs> I swear to God, it was the very first recipe that popped up. People take for granted like, we, how we useful made Google it. is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. And, uh, you know, uh, that's it. So Listen, You know my take. Ranch is for rookies. Yeah, uh, I mean. Anti-ranch men over there. Dude, and that's all good. I, you know how many people... I fucking hate ranch. I won't eat ranch, but I love yours. <laughs> oh, yeah, dude. So, so in other words, you like uh, mayonnaise like with some spices in it. Cause that's what it is. Dude. That's all it is. It's, and that circles back. We talk a lot on the show about marketing. And at the end of the day, you could wrap anything almost in anything and resell it as something else. And to just say right there, it's that simple. I just took the recipe from Google. It's a yep. simple ranch recipe. That's not the biggest thing that I want to worry about. I got the place to open, place to run. I've got different sandwiches to put on, get creative with. But that's not what makes the chicken sandwich. It's not the ranch. What's the, what's the real secret sauce and why the people are loving this? 
Uh, the true method, honestly, uh, is in how you cut the chicken. It, it's really all in the chicken. It's how you cut the chicken. It's how you uh, tenderize the chicken. In this case, we got uh, a hammer. And um, <laughs> But seriously, I mean, that really is what it is. It's in how you cut it, what, how uh, you prepare it. What piece of chicken are you using? The I use chicken thigh. breast. So uh, we've gone down the whole thing of, you know, chicken thigh, you know, marinate them or cure them or brine them or chicken breast, you know, like this or that. And, it, dude. We take chicken breast, we pound them just to a certain way. I don't weigh them. I don't anything. I cut them with my hand. We pound them with a hammer. We put them in flour with some salt and pepper in it. We put it in some buttermilk with some salt and pepper in it and some sriracha, and we put it back in the flour. We put it in the fryer. Keep the fryer clean. Have clean oil. What kind of oil are you using? I use canola. Okay. I just use canola because it, it's the most stable. You know, you can – and honestly, peanut fries really well, but so many people have peanut allergies. allergies. Yeah. So I don't even bother. Um – you know, and it just burn, it burns the cleanest at a, at a high temperature. Um, what temp you on your bricks? 350, 350, you know, and, and don't, don't overcomplicate it. I think that's where a lot of people <laughs> fuck up with the yeah. chicken is they, they really, everybody's like trying to do too much. They're trying to search for the, for the best yeah. way to do it. And dude, just make it, make it simple. Use good, good ingredients. And uh, that's it, man. Wait, Honestly, it's simple. As a guy that's not in the kitchen too often, cause I'm in the front typically. That so many places you walk into where the the fryer is just like it's just black. At what point are you actually supposed to be changing the fryer <laughs> oil in the fryer? Like, shouldn't uh, it be pretty transparent for the most part? It should part? definitely not be black. No, nah, dude. I'm yeah, exaggerating yeah. a little bit, but <laughs> um, I mean, dude, I know those places. We, yeah, we've definitely <laughs> all seen. Oh yeah, that. And, and, and we've all eaten at those places. Yeah. Yeah. you know, and it will continue exist. to on any given night. You know <laughs> what I mean? Let's be real. That's just flavor we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you'll just know, especially the thing with frying something like chicken is that so much excess flour will fall off into the oil that you'll get in the bottom of it you'll get roux that's like four which which is just flour and, and fat mixed yep. you know to people that aren't familiar with cookery um and there will be a shit ton of that in the bottom even it's after like, just one day of frying a lot it's of like chicken. running your hand through wet sand oh yeah it's exactly it's exactly yep. like that um so yeah so so you just want to change it a lot you know you want to change it frequently um, I have a 50-pound a, a fryer, which is a big fryer at the birdhouse. So you get a little, we'll, we'll get like two days out of it, uh, three days out of it at the most, um, just out of saturation at that point of, of the oil and the flour. But, you know, just change it as much as you, if you think it's shitty, get rid of it and put new oil. That's, uh, and that will help you in your endeavor. In a lot of restaurants trying to pivot through the pandemic and do pretty much exclusive to-go items, it's... It was prime for you to open up this new space here, not knowing what's going to happen in the future. But being that the price points are acceptable, where people could come in, get good food, and walk out, they're not getting $17 plates or $18 plates that then have to travel well to get home, which is, I think, the hardest part of all these restaurants. I mean, just yeah. you got a barbecue restaurant. The food travels pretty well for the most yeah. part, right? Yeah, that, that's, a good, that's a good food yeah, item lucky, to go. Lucky barbecue. for us, it works. Barbecue travels well. Yeah. So in, Except for french fries. Yeah. No one's figured that out yet. Yeah, no, nah, there, there's, <laughs> there's no way. Is I don't there, think that is going to get there. Is there a piece of that menu design, though, that was really specifically focused to kind of COVID to goes at this point? or? Um, I mean, just the whole thing lends itself well to that, luckily. You know what I mean? It's just it's just one of those things that um, we're really just lucky with it. You know, I, I didn't really have that much foresight into it other than, uh, you know, the, the price point, like you said, the price structure was like, all right, how, how can we do this and make it? You know, not so cheap that it's like, you know, I can't compete. I, I have to make money, you know, but not so expensive also that, like you said, people are like, oh, dude, 20 bucks. And I also don't want people to ever feel like they're getting ripped off. So that's why, obviously, when we all challenge that with the to-go, uh, anybody that's going through the to-go struggles right now, it's, you know, it's not the same thing. It's truly, truly not. So at least this sort of thing, um, you know, it's only to go. So I guess you, it, it's harder to compare it to what it would be like if you sit down in quotes, you know, because it only comes one way. So um, are there even seats in the restaurant right now? Or zero. No, no there's right. no straight seats. Straight in, straight out. Yeah, straight in, straight out. We really, really try to um, force the uh, enforce as much or, or just suggest that people order online as much as possible because it's just it's easy for us and it's it's perfect for the customer man you could go online you hit the button you hit your pickup time you walk in the door you get your food you're gone so uh it, it, it's been it's been it really fits uh the way the world's going you know and obviously none of us know when, when this uh will get back to normal if ever at this point so 
the, on, the online ordering has like skyrocketed in the last like eight months. Yeah. It was always a, we've always tried to get p- push people to go online because yeah. we just feel like sales are better too because they'll see things. Yeah, click a bu- people love clicking buttons. Oh my thing. god! They just press whatever. And I think a end. lot of people are, are scared of it, especially. All right, so I'm from Stratford. I don't know if you guys are f- familiar with the Connecticut area at all, but Stratford, Connecticut, uh, we have a big uh, helicopter plant there, Sikorsky Helicopter. Oh yeah, yeah, right on the uh, so it, right it's on the water a, it's there, an, yeah. you know awesome hardworking blue collar people, me included, being one of them. So people all know each other, and they're like, "Dan, I know you. Why, why am I going online when I could just call <laughs> you? I could just call you, because dude, you're... trust me, it's fucking easier, dude. It's better. It's better. You don't even have to talk. You don't gotta yeah. wait in line. I don't gotta ask you. Hey, man, could you put your mask on, right, please? You know, like we don't have to do that. Right. You can just walk in the door, get your shit, be out. You could still text me later, but that was really good, and uh, it, it just it works, man. So I think people need to start to understand how awesome it really is. Do you have a uh, POS that like makes it easy, like toast, integrated? Yeah. Do you use toast? Okay. I, and I was shit talking it, and they because anytime these guys pop out of the work, you gotta try it. You gotta try it. Finally, I was like, all right, dude, let's try it. It's great. I found I find toast to be the best integrated POS as far as I don't know how much money they spend on like getting uh, partnered with Instagram and stuff like right. that. They're the only one that you can go on Instagram and link. Like, oh, you guys order need now, to tell right me now. about that. You guys got, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, uh, yeah, because. Nah, I don't even know about that. Like right now, for our, like our POS isn't linked to Instagram. So if you go to Instagram and you hit the order now button, it, it sends them to the Grubhub. And then we eat, we got to eat the 18%, you know, of, right. of whatever we go to Grubhub. But Toast has some kind of partnership with Instagram and they're one of the partners. So you can get that order now button to go right to the Toast tab. And then you it sends wow. them to your POS instead of Grubhub. And then you don't have to eat that. Okay. I literally Dude, told my POS gems. company. That, that's brilliant. Yeah, I told my POS company, you guys have to get this. Because right now, we're doing the work. We're getting somebody to come to our Instagram. We got the customer, and then we're sending them to a third party to, you, yeah, exactly. to make the order. Yeah. And then I got to pay that out. We did the work to get them, and then I'm giving them 18% to go make an order online. Right. Wow, okay, dude. You can never just win. You're getting robbed either on the front or the oh, back. somehow, <laughs> somehow. The moment somebody finds out you're making money, it's over. Somehow. Okay, it's over. Uh, that's not an ad for toast, by the way. No, no, no. No, because I have, I don't know. And I'm sure there's other ones that are just as good. You I've, know? I've read that, like, the merchant processing on toast is a little bit higher. So it's like, which yeah. which one do you... Is do you the mean? toast... I don't, is, I don't understand merchant processing at all. Every time someone calls up and they're like, oh, we could save you money on your credit card bills. I don't, they start talking about basis points and this, that. I mean, believe me, I can get a, a bunch of people right now to call that would be like, don't use toast, it's fucking dog right. shit. But you know, for, for me, in this instance... I've talked to it several works, guys that love it, 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 works, it works, so it's, man. you know... Works, it works. And I use exactly. Square on the truck. Square is really easy too, just for straight up back and forth, uh, you know, contactless transactions. And Square is what we use at Diner, and that was my first interaction with the Square system, but it's simple and it works. Yeah. So, so you're saying that the, using the Square is probably more beneficial in something that's smaller, like a truck, where there's actually just items, not really customized everything. Yeah, day. exactly. Yeah. It, They're it, not set up for a full POS. I mean, you could. I, I don't. I don't have that. I'm. I'm sure you easily could uh, in your restaurant because they, they absolutely do small retail. I know that. You know what I mean. So I'm. I'm sure you could. You know, modify it to do that without any difficulty. It's really um, funny because, and we've talked. And Square. About it. Sorry to interrupt. Square gives out money too. Dan, can I interrupt me? <laughs> sorry, no. bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, no, but we've talked about it a few times too, where, you know, just here at Smokehouse was in a very fortunate position because. Over the years, he's been combating using Uber and Seamless. Not to say that it hasn't been used ever, but really trying to big up, hey, go through our proprietary system. Help us make a little bit of money here instead of giving it away to you know somebody that's not really doing anything here. And you have the point system involved in your thing, too, where everyone comes in, they scan the receipt, they get their points, they get a discount. Do you nix the discount right now? with No, 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 we're, we're doing it. I'd rather give someone 10% off here organically than pay 18 or 20%, yeah. 30% to Uber. So. Promos code. Smoke squad. Yeah. 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 Completely. Yeah, dude. And that's that's important. <laughs> and we were just talking a little bit of ice cream a couple weeks ago with Nikki Bona. And we didn't go too This is what far. I'm talking about when you mess up people's names. Nick D. Bona. Nick D. Bona. AKA Nikki, Nikki Scoops. I'm sorry, not Nikki sorry, Bona. Nikki Scoops. <laughs> we were talking about ice cream a little bit, though, too. And you kind of just launched this creamery truck. Literally, it must have been in the making right before the pandemic hit. Because then... That was March, kind of, that you nah, that? Nah, dude. Yeah, we got that uh, April, May. I got it, like, May May 1st, and I got a company down in um, Georgia that, you know, I don't got them. I, there's a company <laughs> down in Georgia 
that built me another trailer. And, Italian. And, I, got, I got a yeah. guy. I got and, a guy. And, and dude, they're they're but they they treat you like that. They're literally you call them and they're calling. Hey, sir, Mr. Cardos, this is Tom <laughs> down a worldwide trailer. And they're you know they're calling it. And okay, well, all right, Tom. So when you get the check, you got to give it to Miss Nancy. She's going. Hey, they're just like that. And they fucking bring that trailer up to you exactly Miss how Nancy. you ordered it. And yeah, and I call them. I find myself. Hey, is this uh is this Miss Nancy? <laughs> so uh yeah, man, the trailer kind of. We got shut down again. I was like, shit, I don't have, I got to do something. So uh, the trailer, having experience with them on our first food truck, I know how long it takes and how much they cost. So I was like, all right, we could, we could scra scratch together the cash, you know, for this because uh, it, it was cheap, dude. You know what I mean? And uh, thank God that uh, my business partner, Pete, well, and hopefully we'll get into some of that in this, you know, if I stop rambling, but um, his family owns a, a beautiful piece of water front property with a restaurant on it and uh since their capacity got shut in half and we had you know cut in half and we had uh the food truck and the ice cream truck on the way and we have no outdoor seating at, at Orin Oak, our actual sit-down restaurant i was like you know let's put the trucks down there and, and they, i mean everybody was all for it and it, it worked beneficially for everybody um because we were able to take all their overflow you know because their business was cut in half of course their capacity was cut in half so now there's people that are used to just walking in there that now can't get in there and we set up a bunch of tables in the parking lot and uh, we, you know, sold ice cream and, and uh, food all summer to them, thank God. So that's uh, a big key to the success of why we're, we are still here right now, that's for sure. Adaptation and just uh, right place, right time. And, you know, thank, thank God we had the family and friends that we do. Were you making a lot of ice cream on a daily basis before you got the truck? Never. Really? Nah. What made you decide that I can just jump into this ice cream game? Uh, people love ice cream. It's on the water, you know, and it's yeah. like, you know, it's a... Uh, um, and I, and I know that, you know, as a kid, I worked at soft serve machines and stuff. The machines are very expensive, but um, the product itself, you know, you find a nice mix and you just put your flavors in it, whatever they may be. And um, I, I ended up buying a, a cool uh, vegan mix that I found, an oat milk mix. And then I had a nice dairy mix that I found. And uh, did we just put different flavors in them and just fuck around, you know, yeah. every week. We're like, oh, check this one out. Check that. And then and then once I realized that I have a mobile liquor license associated with my other truck, a.k.a. a catering license. And they allowed us to sell booze to go. That's when we got the little airplane bottles and started jamming them in the Sundays. And I mean, the thing, I got a thousand Instagram followers in a, in a day and a half off that fucking thing. Damn. Literally. So that worked. And people, you know, because that's what people are going to get lobster rolls or going to get, you know, they're, they're driving around. That's all we could do this summer. Yeah. So uh, it, it, it really, really worked well. What are your uh, most popular flavors of ice cream? Uh, vanilla, man. No matter what you do, no matter what <laughs> That's you do. That's what Nikki said too. No matter what you do, no, and, and I would run out of that sometimes, and they would be mad. They'd be they'd be pissed off. It's too much risk. There's nothing yeah. wrong with no. a good vanilla. You know, they want to judge off the vanilla, of course. What uh, What are typical components that are going into an ice cream truck? That I mean, at least what's on your truck? I guess I should say, if you haven't seen a thousand different ice cream right, trucks. Right. So I mean, any concession truck, immediately you need. A water tank with sinks, obviously. You need a hand sink, and this is any concession truck. Any truck, you need hand sinks, you need a three-bay sink, and you need a drain tank for all of your dirty water. Um, and then you need some sort of power source. So I, I got the trailer with that, and then all I put on it was two um, uh, soft-serve machines that have two flavors each, and then you could blend the flavor. And I had a small uh, freezer that one of them went on. You know, that one of the machines went on a small freezer, and then I had a small refrigerator, and that's literally in a TV. And, uh, yeah. Downtime, keep busy. Yeah, because, of course, there's downtime, man. All right, so you're not offering more than two flavors at a time? Four no, flavors. you have four flavors total, and then a blend of those two. Oh, got gotcha. you. And, and then you, what you do, obviously, is, you know, but then you just, you know, you. that's yeah. when I realized the Sundays. Yeah. I started with toppings, and then they turned into, you know, all right, dude, I'm going to get... I got orange sorbet today and vanilla oat milk. All right, cool. I'm going to get Grand Marnier and some sort of cookies and some sort of, you know, next thing you know, you got one Sunday and you got, you know, then you got six Sundays on the thing all of a sudden. To have that catering liquor license, you have to reapply to whichever spot you're parking at kind of every time, no? No. So, so what we did is they, um, we have a catering license, which is essentially an extension of Orin Oaks liquor license. So your liquor license here at least in Connecticut, if you get a catering license, you can go on private property anywhere and serve booze legally. Yeah. Especially if you set up a perimeter. But since we didn't need to set up a perimeter this summer in Connecticut, and we're on private property, Pete's family owns Snaps Landing, dude, I was like, 
like gold mine. Dude, this is unbelievable. Yeah. Like right place, right time. You know what I mean? Why is anybody opening up anything in New York? Like right, the laws are just man. so much more lax well, outside. Yeah, I mean they're, Connecticut's tough. They're too. lax now, but New York is. They make it hard to just like yeah. bang out an idea. Yeah, and so does Connecticut, man. I mean, yeah. it, I couldn't have done this if it wasn't for the summer. But now that I have, I'm I'm gonna try it every year. I you mean, know? you could definitely get a little more leeway now because it seems like yeah. Right now they're like, yeah, if you want to try it, go I mean, ahead. And once try I said it, so once can... I once I saw it, I could go into a, any restaurant and literally get a glass of wine to go. Yeah. Well, that was the big was game like, changer. Right, as, soon as, that, as soon as that changed, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. As soon as that changed, it changed like everything. Yeah, it changed the whole dynamic. Could take out anywhere. So. So that and that was you know helpful in that in that instance. And then oh. we ran out of aluminum and plastic bottles. And yeah. Everything Instantly. started being short, but that's a whole other story. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned that there was no outdoor seating at Orinoco. Is that just because the way the restaurant's set yeah, up? Yeah, man. Or? We're, we're uh, a center. We're, we're in a strip mall, man, it's straight up. And we're uh, one of the center, um, you know, lots in the strip mall or center spaces. So to the left of me, to the right of me, there's really no parking lot except directly in the front of me. And uh, it's just I didn't want to be one of those dudes that was like, hey, man, come sit in my parking lot. I just I, I just didn't. Um, especially if, if I could have made it look nice and built an extension and done it, then yeah. But I don't want to ever lure people down under the guise of outdoor seating. <laughs> and then, you know, you come out there and there's some dude walking out of the liquor store, you know, slamming little bottles and throwing them on the ground, chain smoking cigarettes. I'm like, hey, here's your view. So uh, I, I didn't really, really. And luckily, like I said, we had Naps Landing at our disposal. So um, we, I was like, let's just get the people down there, dude. Have you seen this video, guys, of the lady that was in, I think, California, and she owned the restaurant, and she was trying to get permits to sit people outside forever, and then all of a sudden, a big movie company came in to shoot something, and they took over the entire parking lot oh, with and catered started, tables, yeah. and just were, like, feeding people out there yeah, like it was man. nothing. Oh. Like, that's heartbreaking. I didn't see that. No, it's tough. Oh. That's tough stuff. But as he, he touched on that, I was just talking, we had a uh, Chamber of Commerce meeting, that I guess I'm becoming more I'm becoming more involved with the Good. Chamber of Commerce because they have no restaurant representation. Uh, we have like 19 restaurants on the Ave, and there's no representation in the Chamber. So I got involved with them a little bit. We had the same problem with the outside. They like gave us the parking spaces in the summer, which which was like, it saved us a lot, to be honest, because we yeah. made up a lot of revenue that we wouldn't have had over the summer. Right. Um, you know, so that was definitely a positive. But I did notice the same thing, like just what you said. Welcome down the block. We were able to make it look nice. We got yeah. a couple, we got a couple of trees. We yeah. put a lighting out there. You know, we kind of secluded it from the street, so you didn't feel like you were sitting on the street. But if we were walking up and down the ad, we saw just know, shit you don't want to see. Really crappy yeah. setups. So I told it. I told the chamber because they're talking about giving us, like you said, um, like permanent outdoor seating and like doing that kind of thing for the summer. And now I'm trying to work with the chamber to get everybody to have like the same outdoor setup. Like so yeah. they, requirements. If, yeah, like, like if they're gonna do it. We can make it look nice and say you have to either make it look nice or not do it because it, some of them just look so bad. Like no one I wants know. to come down here. I know. <laughs> I was like, and and sure enough, when you're around anything uh, for so long, you become desensitized about it. And I think everyone was noticing and seeing at first outdoor seating happening, and they were excited. You could have put them next to piles of shit, and they still yeah. would have been happy to eat outside. But as time goes on, and then you see these guys that are like. Wait, this isn't acceptable. We need to jazz this thing up. We got to spruce it up. We got to get house plants out here. We got to yeah. get heaters out here. We're gonna put paintings on the the fake walls that we just yeah. built, and, and then it raises standards. Yeah, and to your point, there were some guys in the in our complex that that were fucking ahead of us, dude. These guys jumped the gun, and these guys <laughs> had like fake tropical plants out there, <laughs> like yo, make a whole vibe. They, yo, they, they, they honestly, it. they killed it. And once I saw that, I was like, oh, we're not competing with that. dude. <laughs> I was like, you know what? I look over, we got this little planter box on like wheels, right? <laughs> Fucking shit falling out. I'm like, ah, oh, dude, we can't. I we saw can't, one guy at palm trees. I was like, I got to get palm trees. Yo, dude, it's it like, becomes a competition. Yeah. yeah it's yeah, like, it's yeah. like, uh, it's like, uh, Christmas you know, the lights. Christmas ornaments, yeah, Christmas lights. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. When you went into your, your real first endeavor here, uh, I guess we should say major kitchen slash partnership and ownership, that was in Milford. Yeah. Are you still a piece of this business? No, nah, but I love those dudes, man. Okay. Uh, Liberty Rock Tavern, yeah, they're great dudes, man. Um, and we opened that place up together with, with no money. And, uh, I mean, no money. This was a local community spot, pretty much, it feels yeah, like, man. from all the pictures that I took a, a gander at. Oh, yeah. And it's like, I would imagine it had a lot more of a late-night bar feel, too. 
Yeah. Oh, that's what it was, man. Yeah, and it, it is. That's what it is. Obviously, that's been stripped from us. Um, but yeah, man, it, it was. Uh, it is a, a little spot in Milford. It was a cop bar for like twelve years, fourteen years. A buddy of ours who was a detective owned it, and um, he was retired, of course. And um, I love that term, by the way, cop yeah. bar. Like, um, dude, but, yo, you want to go, blah blah. Dude, it's a cop bar. Oh, dude, I mean, it, it, that just means like, <laughs> okay, you want to go? It's fucking. It's like Roadhouse, dude. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> so uh, it was. It was beloved. It was a great little place. And uh, when he was done with it, he's like, you know, guys, I, I just, I'm, I'm done. I, I had my fun. Um, we were able to get our hands on it, and, and we redid it. And uh, you know, we just had a really small menu there, like six, seven items. Um, we were open for you know dinner and, and late night eats and, and, and drinking and hanging out. And uh, it, it was a cool little place. It is a cool little place. But right now, obviously, um, you know, everything closes at ten o'clock, at least where I am. So it's certainly put a damper on it for the time being. But things will bounce back, I'm sure. Tell me about that kind of first menu that you put together there, though. Were you flexing the creative skills a little bit further more than what you would typically wind up seeing in, you know, the local hangout? Sure. Oh, yeah, 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 dude. Uh, you know, any any place that, that I'm the chef, that I am, um, you know, fully autonomous in the creation of the food, uh, I'm just always going to make what I want to make. And, uh, you know, that's a culmination. I've been doing this since, since 1995, dude. So for me... Um, you know, I'll put whatever. Dude, I had octopus on the menu. I had duck confit on the menu. I had, you know, escargot on the menu. We we we, run, we just run through the run of what we run through. You, you had escargot on a late night bar. Sure, menu yeah, and I probably food. sold two orders of it too. Yeah, and two <laughs> shots of Jameson. You know what I mean? I probably sold two. But yeah, you know, we try and do, and it, and that's the beauty of it, though. If you change the menu frequently, you, you know, you just get, and that's the power of the internet too. You get on the internet, go, yo guys, I got escargot this weekend. I know it sounds stupid. Do what happens. Come try it. And you just get a little bit and you try it out. And you get a couple guys, you know, you get a couple people that come try it out. And, um, you know, but the one thing that we could not get away from and still cannot get away from at that place, as is evident, is the chicken sandwich, dude. I never thought. Is that where the chicken sandwich started? Yeah. And I never thought that people, like, dude, I, we threw that place together and, you know, everything got pushed back and delayed and this and that and blah, blah, blah. I didn't have the menu until, you know, the day before. Like the you know that's how I open every restaurant, and um, yeah. So the chicken sandwich. I remember the first day we were you know serving them, selling them. And people were like, "Oh my god, it's chicken sandwich!" I'm like, "Guys, like, come on!" <laughs> and uh, yeah, and that's uh, that's that's history of the chicken sandwich, literally right there. Would you say you work better under pressure? Yeah, I, and, and, yeah. I feel like anybody that's successful uh, in this in this industry, I would I would say that you have to be right. I mean, um, because like, well, let's be honest, we're all procrastinators. You don't find the greatness until you really need it. Nah, man. You know what I mean? Until it's, you know, game seven. <laughs> what was that's, the... that's definitely it. Wait until game seven. That's for it, sure. man. Yeah. I'm like Allen Iverson. <laughs> what practice? You know? <laughs> practice. What was the transition into opening Orin Oak from there? Uh, Orin Oak, I, I think we were just... Um, I just had a lot of the experience of, of you know, a lot of, like like, just the dumb stuff that you do the first time, like... You know, just the, the, the naivete is gone. Um, and, and uh, you know, so at the time, I, I was still very much involved at Liberty Rock. And the only reason I ever left is it just became too hard to, to do both. You know, so me and my business partner, current business partner and, and uh, only business partner, Pete, we, um, you know, sort of just we, we decided we were going to do Oren Oak, et cetera, et cetera. But same story. We had no money, blah, 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 blah. We get the place open. And, um, you know, I, I think that that's kind of just... That's the story. That's the restaurant story that everybody, you know, like there is no, uh, I would say to anybody that wants to do a spot, especially in today's world, don't get an investor, especially right away, unless you have multiple concepts and you're ready or multiple units and you're ready to blow them out and roll it up and sell it. Don't get an investor because they're never going to be happy. They never seems will. seems to be the repeating theme. And, and, and the it's, not, the it's, theme. it's not that they're bad people. Investors are not bad people. It's just on a, like, a ground level they don't want to get in on the ground not in the food business dude you Much know risk. it's just and it's so little reward man you know like like they need to get their money back and uh, luckily I, I have never personally been in that situation thank god so. well, when we were able to get or I mean, we're building out our original location right now and we were able to get an actual we got a loan for the thing which we never thought we were going to get <laughs> right <laughs> and we got a loan for it and i we were like Nice. No, yeah. no way. We got loan. Yeah. We got it. We can build it out. Like, all right. Yeah. We don't need Forget nobody. Forget everything else. Yeah. It's on us, and we're good. And we're good to go. 
Well, it was easier when you had something to show from here, though. I'm going to tell you, alone, for right? two years, we were trying to get a loan. Oh, and you talking to every bank. Like, nothing. They're like, what do you want to do? Oh, a restaurant. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> no thanks. Well, what was the pinnacle change and finally getting the call back? Uh, COVID. Yeah, that was it. It was like the one thing that broke right because there were some SBA loans that became available. Yeah, yeah. Yep. You know, okay. it was like one of the few things. Yep. So one we were able to... You know, it was like a specific, we had just, we closed the original location. It was a specific uh, turn of events. And we had already planned that that building. So it was it was considered um, planned planned construction, which qualified for yeah. uh, for the loan. So we were able to get that loan. And I was like, it's the best thing ever. <laughs> yeah, dude. Because uh, you still wouldn't be able to get a loan. Not for a restaurant. No. <laughs> that, that's the hardest part is that anybody that's trying to do this is the fundraising clearly but believe it or not the one good thing that is coming out of this whole horrible situation that we've all been through is there are a lot of people that um you know want to get out now and just for way and i'm not trying to sound like you're going to scoop it up and rob these people because they want to get out they want to be done there's there's a lot of spots now that you could get better leases on you can get um better options on just be creative with it man don't think that this is just going to come back to you know, rooms full of people. Cause I don't know that it ever will really be like that again for a while, you know, at least for the foreseeable future in the restaurant world and just change, be willing to constantly adapt. I mean, we survive because we constantly change all the time. Yeah. The speed of pivots has been like wild. Yeah, you have to, we were talking about just an hour ago. You it's know. like how quick we had to make change. And, and don't be scared to try. I get a lot of times like, you know, especially in older, more well-established places that have, you know, maybe uh, multiple units or, um, you know, just a shit ton of history, they're always worried to change. Just try something new. Yeah. Like, just try it. Do you like, feel that as you've become so known for one thing, though, over the course of time, that it, they just look at it as too much risk to change? Although I look at it adversely, where if you don't change, you'll become a thing of the past if you're letting all these other trends slip by you before you even figure them out. And, and that's why I think, you know, like to your point, yes. Yeah, so you, you want to always have the foundation of whatever it is that you make. If you make, you know, uh, chocolate chip cookies, you want the fucking best chocolate chip cookie that you could possibly produce and do that forever. And I think that a lot of times people, especially like this used to be a thing, like in the, in the late nineties, early two thousands is you would get dudes that have, bunch of money they get together in a group and they would open you know i'm not going to say any kind of places that are like this but they would open restaurant groups that are really just concept based but they don't really have mm -hmm. you know they, they don't have the execution is shit you know what i mean it really is and you know they crank out four or five places and you see them pop up really fast but then that trend changes because they're literally following the market instead of leading the market you know what i mean they're not the ones that are coming up with you know they're got you, like you like, like remember 10 years ago burger chains were popping up everywhere Exactly what I was thinking about. You know what I'm saying? Like and it's Bear like burger, five napkin burger, all this. Yeah, stuff. and you know I'm not I'm not saying and not saying they're good or they're bad, but you know like it when the guy that you know was just making hamburgers the whole time, he's still there because you know he's passionate about it, means something to him, his product is good, and I, I feel like you know that's just do that and just then you can always add new things and not really alienate your old customers, you know, or they they'll they won't be so hesitant to try new things from you. Yeah, it always comes it always comes down to the product. Always does. Yeah. Because you can jazz it up with whatever atmosphere and this, got that going on or whatever. And all that shit matters too, yeah. big time. No, for sure. Because we've all seen the, places that you're the, like, I don't get this place. Yeah. That are crazy busy, so. But if the but if the main thing sucks, it's like you go there once the for the you go there once for the vibe, and then if it sucks, you're probably not going to go yeah. back. Fucking you always axe get, throwing. In fact, I was listening. <laughs> I was a, the axe throwing. I was listening to a <laughs> podcast and one of the restaurants. It was a restaurant guy, and he said, he was saying on the podcast, oh, we're not restaurants anymore. You have to be a media company first. Mm -hmm. We're a media company, and then we sell food. And I'm like, yeah. what? What does that make any sense? Like, and I'm sure that guy probably has way more money in all yeah, of the, you know, than we have. But it just didn't hit to me. I was like, no, the core, if you're a restaurant, then your core, you're a, food. You're a, you make food. You yeah. make good food. And then the media comes around that. I think the problems are similar in... Restaurants they in got general. too into their Instagrams and, and the TikToks too far into it. Yeah, but that, that's the thing is every restaurant is different in the way that it's set up and in the way that it's presented. 
And some restaurants are far better at doing something on media. And we see it. We know these places. And you see them crushing Instagram. You see them crushing TikTok. You see them crushing all this stuff. Yeah, but I went to those places. And then the crunch wrap is fucking awesome. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> Yo, John, we see you, bro. Morgan, we see you. We but then you again, you, you can walk into another spot that's busy as all hell, too, with a line out the door waiting. And they have zero presence online whatsoever. And it's like, it depends on your business model. It depends on what you're doing. Like, you don't have to do what everybody else is doing if you could concentrate on just doing something well. If you hit that pinnacle where you finally grab the attention of somebody, and those are those old type of places that have been, like, just built up word of mouth where yeah. people show up to them. You know the places. They're just, like, these old school white tablecloth places pretty much, and they never changed. They never did what everyone else was doing. And now look, you go there almost like, almost like a nostalgia factor to some extent. Sure. But also you're getting like a hearty meal for a decent price and nobody's trying to hit you over the head because they don't have those added on costs that other guys wind up partaking in for all the various advertising that they have going out the door and whatnot. Uh, you're doing something though with, with Orin Oak here and I want to relate it to maybe like a, almost like the Apple ecosystem to an extent. Because you did now the Oren Oak. You've got the Oren Oak Creamery truck. You've got the Oren Oak Birdhouse. It's like how long until I get the accessory where I could put them all in my bag and put them yeah. in my Oren Oak <laughs> backpack and walk out. You know, uh, that, that kind of, the reason that we did that is uh, obviously for, for brand recognition, but we're really just in such uh, an area that is, um, I guess, like off the beaten path, really. So it's like, before I start to go into other markets, I wanted to really have uh, my market, uh, our market, you know, where we are locally, saturated, I guess, in a way that like, okay, everybody knows now in our town or in the neighboring towns, you know, what's going on, who we are, what we do. And now I feel like I could go into, you know, Milford, I could go into Fairfield, I could go into Trumbull, I could go into Shelton, you know, I could go into the towns around me and enough people will know already and sort of get that buzz. And, you know, I just seen, I've seen other people do that. You know what I mean? I've seen like Colony Pizza do that. I've seen like, and I'm sort of just trying to speed up that process because I don't have 50 years to wait, dude. You know what I mean? I, I don't. So we're kind of trying to be like, all right, let's just stack our town out, get, you know, get known, you know, but still be able to, to execute and maintain it all so it doesn't all just fall apart when we do try to grow. Yo, is that an Orin Oak transmission repair shop? Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, right, exactly, <laughs> dude. Right. <laughs> it's, Orin Oak brake pads. <laughs> it, I mean, it's not absurd to think, and uh, I agree with you fully. Brand recognition is huge, and you're already starting the momentum of the business. So as you expand it into other territories, you're just putting the Orin Oak name in other people's mouths. That's it. Whichever factor of you know the restaurant business or hospitality that they're frequenting. So they might just go to your, you know, birdhouse location. They right. might only hit the ice cream truck because they're, you know, 17-year-old kids that yeah. love ice cream. Exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, dude, you just reminded me of fucking space balls, though, dude. Space balls, toilet paper. <laughs> I, I was wondering if it was appropriate. I was, as soon as he said that, I was like, merchandising, merchandising. <laughs> with the real money from yogurt. the movie is me. <laughs> yogurt. But yeah, I mean, you know, that's, that's exactly what... Uh, you know what we're trying to do, or an oak the flame is, and, and, and yeah, and, <laughs> and there is people, yeah, and there is people that you know, like you said, man. You know, there are seventeen-year-old kids that don't really want to go to our sit-down restaurant. They'd be like, "What the fuck is this, dude?" You know. So hopefully that I can reach enough markets so that when those people that are twenty now or twenty-three now are you know thirty years old or you know forty years old and now have kids, maybe like, oh, dude, we used to go to this uh, birdhouse, you know. Oh, but they got an ice cream place too. So it's something that can sort of like grow and develop uh, with time as well. Um, so we do try to hit each uh, demographic in our area so that, A, I'm not cannibalizing myself, right? And then B, um, you know, it's something that you could sort of just perpetuate and, and hopefully, you know, knock on wood, nothing is set in stone in this business. If the area is big enough, do you think it's a pitfall to have three Taco Bells right next to each other? And I, I use the term Taco Bell. Yeah. Um, you know... Dude, I don't know. I mean, I ask myself that all the time, you know, because you'll see, you know, like you see like two Chipotle's in a town, like a lot. But there seems to be a reason, or, you know, in a town, I mean a city, you know what I mean? Yeah. Three, four, five in a city. But I guess it's, I don't know. I, I guess you got to look at people's sales and you're like, you know, when I used to work for Barcelona, those dudes, those dudes had like three Barcelonas in Atlanta and they were all fucking busy, man. They were all busy. All of them. 
all the time. So it's like, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if you could really oversaturate your own, your own town. If you have, you know, population density, of course, um, in enough of a name, you know, I mean, I think that you can, it kind of, it's really up to you. Depends on, on what you can do, you know? We've been discussing Too Big Too Fast a lot, and it seems like the route in which you're going and expanding the Orin Oak ecosystem, though, is kind of the right way to keep the brand expanding without oversaturating things. Yeah, because honestly, we could, if we had to, if this all goes bad tomorrow, now I feel like we could easily just retract it all and jam it into one building and just wait out the storm like Noah's Ark over there, dude. You know what I mean? If I really, really had to. Um, you know, because I don't, I'm not overextended as far as, you know, our operational costs. Dude, I got, you know, we got two little food trucks, a takeout restaurant that has one person answering a phone and one person in the kitchen and a restaurant. You know what I mean? Like that's, I don't have, I don't have a lot of employees, you know, and that's the one thing that we're, we're very, very thankful that when this all happened, we didn't have a lot of employees. So we didn't have to displace a lot of people. Thank God, because so many people obviously, you know, lost jobs. A lot of people got help, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, you know, we've always just been a crew of a handful of people. And um, we're just trying to find out now, like we're realizing like, all right, man, like how can I do X sales with, you know, a very limited amount of, you know, what can I really hit at, at, at Birdhouse? How busy can we really get before I need to put another guy in the kitchen? You know, like how busy can we? I'm sort of starting to look at things like that, you know. Like minimizing labor so that two things. Thing one, I could pay my cooks the absolute best that I could pay them and the most that I could pay them. Give them the best quality of life because, you know, we're open for, I'm open from 12 o'clock to 7.30. You know what I mean? And that's their work day. We prep all the food at the restaurant and we deliver it to ourselves. So it's like I kind of use the restaurant now. I have it as a commissary as well, you know. Um, and that's where we store all our ice cream stuff in the summertime. And that's where, you know, all the food truck food is prepped. So I'm able, if the restaurant's slow, I'm able to still justify having my cooks there because they're prepping everything. So it just makes the most sense. And it's just how, like, I, we had to change the model because I want cooks to be able to, to make a living, dude. When I was a cook, I had to bartend and do other things that I, you know, shouldn't do to, to survive and make money, man. Um, you know, because the line cooking jobs, they just don't pay it. And it's not because you, you see a lot on the Internet of, of people who are dumb, just fucking dumb. Be like, oh, pay your pay your employees a living wage. Dad, I wish I could pay everybody fifty dollars an hour. Right. I right. mean, but you don't want to pay eighty dollars for a fucking hamburger. Right. Exactly. So until you're willing to pay eighty dollars for a hamburger instead of ten dollars for a pack of smokes and spend twenty bucks a day on fucking lottery tickets, I don't know what to tell you. That's a that's a statement and a half right there. Like, and it's right. Uh, that's exactly how it should be broken. I don't know what to tell you. Anybody saying that? Because I would love to pay everybody fifty dollars an hour, or forty, or thirty, or whatever. That's where you start to get to see guys start going into uh, revenue sharing and uh, sweat equity and stuff like that, just yeah. just to try to mend the gap, which we've spoken about. And a there's bunch a lot of, of people that are, that are really creative with yeah. that kind of stuff. So, and yeah. you see what that repeatedly the, uh, throughout the bars. This is sweat equity. You want to come on as management? Awesome. I'm going to let you work two days behind the bar to make extra money because I'm only going to pay you this much money because we're not making enough money. Right. You, you and I think that's a brilliant. All the time. I love that plan. No, he used to ask me. Let me get a bar. Let me get a bar. Shit. It was. It wasn't really for the money. It was more. I wanted to do everything in the restaurant. I wanted to be that one person who was, you know, that guy. Yeah. When you you didn't let me have it though. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're not. You got the last day. The last day. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just. I'm just jumping out here in thought because that's how my mind works. You put this ice cream truck away in the winter time. Yeah. It's done. It's done. Now it's just sitting there somewhere. That was gonna turn into. Uh, yeah. I was going to do a, um, a sandwich shop with, with a buddy of mine. I um, thought you were going to go waffles, bro. Nah. Waffles, like we're I was, on the mountain in the wintertime. I was going to do, we were going to do a little sandwich shop with a person who's really well known on this podcast if he's <laughs> listening. Um, but it just, you know, we just, everybody is too busy right now just trying to do it. Um, but the summer, the plan is for next year is to maybe just have it as like a little, it could be like, a, I don't have a hood on there. Like, so I can't really... You know, I could put, like, steam tables on there or, like, you know, toasters. I can make sandwiches, that kind of stuff, long story right. short. So maybe uh, next year we, we sell, like, ten kinds of soups on it and uh, just put it somewhere. You know, put, it at, put it in a church in the winter or something, you know. So, I mean, there are there, – that was in the works. That is in the works. We're always thinking how we can maximize. Um, but 
right why, now. You why know. are there not enough soup places? Why is it not a thing? Like uh, I'm no, so I'm, I'm obsessed <laughs> with soup. Can, you know, can I go left? It real always quick? comes go. back to you my go. soup idea. Yeah. Go. And no one. I, He's been pushing this my, forever, and he refuses my partner, to Mike, make it happen. Right. So we have a split. I run the front house. He runs the back house. It's like soup season right now. I tell him, oh, yeah. yo, we should run a guy. I've said this a bunch of times. <laughs> Why don't you do a soup ghost kitchen? That's, that's what I'm exactly saying. what it is. Yeah. And I tell <laughs> him all the time. I'm like, yo, just do it. You, it's all prep, no execution. Like, you have one guy that can pick up a ladle and fill up a fucking thing. And plus, yo, you send can, it out. And plus, I'll do you it. Have a pet. Do it. So many you people will want it to go. It right, will blow that's what your I'm mind. Saying. Cold. And we you haven't done cold. it yet. And I'm just like, yo, let me get a quart for next week. So easy. You need like three, maybe four soups. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you ever go into the city and Bang just look out. at the line at lunchtime at Hale and Hardy? Oh, it's dude. like around the block. It moves so quick, though, yeah. because it's already just pressed. Scoops. Just scoops. Yeah. That's it. No, I know. You right, don't even take cash. This. You just Let's have to put your card down. Thing. Let's do it. And, I, I mean, you know, you want to make the most out of the tools that you have, and you're doing such by utilizing everybody that's working in the quote-unquote commissary kitchen now that's putting everything out to where it needs to go. So you're working smarter, not harder. Your guys trying are making to, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. your guys are making a little bit more money as a result too, because you're able to give them the labor and the work, and you're justifying their cause being there. And I, to me, it's just logical that you know the ice cream truck is outfitted to be able to do something else in the summer, oh, in the winter time, instead of just sitting around. Absolutely. You know? And just I, I will do whatever branding you need to get soups off the ground. Like, let's go. I'll go sit yeah, right now start. in Photoshop and get it going. I'm going to go on after this and do my little five-minute monologue and talk about soups. <laughs> do it. <laughs> we'll get this shit launched. Waiting on Fry's uh, soup shop. The soup kitchen. No soup for you. <laughs> now, as far as... We moving... get James make a little uh, New England clam chowder mix, whatever. There you go. That blend we were talking about. <laughs> what? Yeah. Now, moving forward, though, into where... I know the UK is talking about mutated strains of coronavirus and going back into lockdown. Are your wheels turning in preparation for possibly getting kind of locked down again? And Oh, yeah, yeah. No, we're absolutely working on a plan for the restaurant, um, for Orin Oak, not the birdhouse, just for uh, Orin Oak sit-down restaurant because, um, you know, my plan is to – I've seen the success, obviously, with uh, birdhouse and, and the need for that. Uh, and just the ease of takeout and, and how it works. So we're going to um, launch the taco concept that we're kind of just, that we have been fooling around with, but just, we've done taco nights a million times. So we're going to get another toast. We're going to put it at Orin Oak because right now I just have some old, you know, POS that came with it. And, uh, you know, we're going to launch. You'll always be able to get the food that Orin Oak has, our small plates, always, always, always. Uh, but all that will be on the to-go menu as well. But we're going to just kind of focus on, uh, you know, offering everything to go, including all of the tacos that we did on lockdown because people were going nuts for them and see if that can sort of help bolster the lost food sales because, you know, dude, we're just not getting... The Orono clientele is like 50 to 60. And those people, some of them are, are scared of COVID and worried about COVID. Um, and, you know, more so, many of them have been, I feel like, especially in Connecticut, like, if you're going out to eat at sit-down places, you're almost sort of like being like shamed at this point. So it's like a lot of our normal See clientele is kind of like, we don't we don't want to, you know, like we haven't been out in months. And they're not necessarily a health risk or even worried. They just don't want to be the ones that are, are known, you know, for gallivanting around town like it's no big deal. Even though we have plexiglass set up. I mean, it's safe. Our tables are really spaced apart. You know, we follow all the precautions and procedures, you know. But obviously the picture that's been painted by the media, as we've all seen, is that, you know, restaurants are where this is happening. And, you know, that's but a whole nother it, and podcast. it's just not. It's just such It bullshit. is not true, dude. I've, I've been saying for like two weeks, I feel like it's you're safer to come out, eat here, than you are to go home. It's yeah, and then we've, we have all, to we've follow, all had like, our experiences with yeah, shopping. we got to clean it. Right? We have to do an extra cleaning. You have to wear this. You have to yeah. wear that. You have to do this. When you go to someone's house, they don't have to do anything. And it's like if the... My whole big thing was in New York is they say, oh, if you have a house party, it's a super spreader event because blah, blah, blah. Right. But no indoor dining at restaurants. I'm like, well, if you close indoor dining at restaurants, everybody's just going to do shit at well, their house. Well, then you're forced. Yeah, of you course. You know, like, and uh, Dave Portnoy went on that rant and he said the <laughs> same thing, like, with the barstool thing. And he was like, where do you think these people are going? When a house party makes it worse. Might as well leave the restaurants open. Yeah. And let them And in. I mean, and honestly, at the end of the day, man, without getting into some long, because this is, this could be a whole nother. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but sure. I mean, dude, it's like the rate, the rate of transmission is, you know, it, it's high in New York. It's high in Connecticut. It's also even higher in places that are more strict than us. 
And it's also lower in places that, that are you know, like, yeah. dude, Fl- Florida has a lower transmission rate. Like, how is that? Po- We're all sitting up here in the north like, look what they're doing down there in Florida. Yeah. <laughs> look at those fucking, assholes up there. They have less cases per 100,000 people. Well, yeah. that's because they're not getting tested. I mean, you know, you could say what you want to say forever. We don't know, man. We're all we're all just hamsters running on the wheel, man. You know, and at this point, like, I don't even know what, but don't single out the restaurants at this point, I feel. And they definitely didn't single us out on the uh, relief bill that they That's just passed. I'm sure. Zero dollars for a restaurant act. That's a whole other show, though. Yeah, save that Save that for another. Me and Bar- Barstool is helping us, though. <laughs> Are they? Mm-hmm. At least yeah. try. You didn't see that? The, I did. Did you guys the, submit your, uh, your request? No, nah, we're still open, so I wouldn't. You know, I feel like right. that's for the city restaurants that are just yeah, getting completely yeah. hosed. Oh, I mean, you know. You have you found that working with all the other restaurants in your town, everyone's kind of come together a little bit more in unison than typical. You're not looking across like Bob's Burgers with the mm-hmm. pizza place across the way yeah. and looking at his pizzas <laughs> being made angrily with all his business. No, no I feel we, we've all tried. You know what I mean? We absolutely are trying to do that, you know, for sure. Um, there's been a lot, a lot of joint pop-ups and all that kind of stuff, but honestly, the morale is just, it really is shattered in the restaurant world right now, man. I see a lot of friends who are, you know, who are fucking hurting, man, who are really, really, really hurting and, you know, having their hearts broken and, um, you know, no end in sight to it, man. You know, and, and, and on paper right now, it's easy to look and be like, oh, well, you know, you, you got, uh, you know, a, a method that's really working. Dude, I don't, man. We j- make just enough money at the birdhouse to float everything else right now and you know it's i guess that's sort of always the game is you know plug the dam with your finger um that's that's just what restaurants seem to be to me on the small scale that i operate on um but you know i I see everybody you know and i feel for everybody going through this man dan thanks for talking with us thanks for coming in plug the uh instagram accounts for everybody to check you out oh uh or an oak birdhouse uh instagram uh or and oak right ct it's safe to say if they just put Chef Dan Cardos, man. Chef Dan Cardos. Just follow me, <laughs> Chef Dan Cardos. You will oh, yeah. see everything. But the orange, what's the deal with the orange Drake cats? Oh, dude, we just got our hands on them. Dude, I, I grew up eating fucking yodels and ring dings, dude. I love them, dude. And I saw them. And uh, we just got a bunch of them. They're great, man. I, I love them. And I love funny bones, dude. Guys, Drake's, stop. They, they, they leave me on scene a lot, but they DM me back sometimes. Like, <laughs> stop leaving me on fucking red, dude. <laughs> Cut the shit. Thank you guys so much. Awesome. Guys, don't forget to smash that like and subscribe button because, you know, algorithms.